proud to host today's gathering of solidarity with the people of Nepal after the tragic earthquake a few weeks ago that claimed thousands of lives. Um, in particular, we want to welcome His Excellency Dr. Arjun Kumar Karki, Ambassador um, of the Embassy of Nepal, and um, His Excellency um, Mr. Ruben Azar, Deputy Ambassador at the Embassy of Israel, and Jason Isaacson, um, the Associate Executive Director for Policy at the American Jewish Committee, who really um, was the driving force behind today's gathering. Um, recently, we awarded our annual prize for the best student writing on Israel to Martha Kramer, who wrote her paper on the hybridized identities of second and third generation Beta Israel. Martha, an African-American student, was captivated by the rescue of Ethiopia's Jews by Israel in the 1970s and 80s and wanted to learn more about their identities as a minority in Israel. Israel's modern rescue of Ethiopia's Jews and the Jews of over 100 other countries combined the principles of ingathering of Jewish exiles as well as pikuach nefesh, the obligation to save a life in jeopardy. As we'll hear today, the value of pikuach nefesh is not limited to Jews. That is why in every modern disaster, from the earthquake in Haiti to the tsunami, to the tsunami in Japan, to the recent earthquake in Nepal, Israel was among the first responders to send teams of doctors, nurses, and paramedics engaging in search and rescue and setting up field hospitals. We look forward today to learning about the unique challenges of the Nepal tragedy, and again, our deepest condolences on the terrible loss of life there, um, what relief efforts are ongoing, and in particular, the great contribution of the Israeli government and its relationship with the government of Nepal. Um, I now want to introduce um, Jason Isaacson. Thank you again. Thank you, Martin. Ambassador Dr. Karki, um, Deputy Ambassador of Azar, the distinguished guests, our American University Center for Israel Studies partners, good friends. It is an honor for me, as well as a source of profound sadness, to stand here with my HAC colleagues in the company of our counterparts and friends in the Nepalese American community and the American Jewish community, and pay solemn tribute to the memories of those Nepalese <coughs> and citizens of other lands who lost their lives in the catastrophic earthquake of April 25 and the second deadly earthquake of just eight days ago. The human toll of this tragedy is numbing in its enormity and swiftness and cruelty, and in the many thousands of lives lost, and in the many more thousands of lives shattered and made desperate. Words are never ad adequate in the face of such disasters. Words of sympathy, words of solidarity, words of remembrance, words of comfort. We utter them, and we mean them most sincerely, but we know they only go so far. What is left for us to do, as men and women of conscience, as compassionate advocates for engagement across national, ethnic, and religious lines, and as friends of Nepal, is not only to mourn and not only to pay tribute, but to assist in very practical ways in the vast and essential process of recovery and rebuilding. HAC has stepped forward, working with our longtime partners in humanitarian relief, the Israeli Emergency Response Organization known as ISRAEB, and helped provide medical personnel who have been on site in and around Kathmandu for more than three weeks. We know that many of our sister Jewish organizations and individual Jews across the United States have stepped forward as well. There has been an outpouring of assistance in parallel with the outpouring of grief and solidarity. We recognize the very substantial American response to this tragedy that has befallen Nepal. The immediate deployment of a U.S. Agency for International Development Disaster Assistance Response Team, the dispatch of U.S. urban search and rescue teams to accompany emergency rescue and relief efforts, and of course the release of millions of dollars worth of emergency supplies. And we, not only that, and we know that not only the United States and Israel, two countries that have of necessity gained international prominence and respect as first responders, but a great many other nations have contributed manpower and other resources to the urgent rescue, recovery, and rebuilding efforts 
the Nepalese people are now undertaking. We honor their commitment and contributions to this cause. And HAC, I pledge to you today, will continue to stand by the people of Nepal. As the rebuilding process continues, we will actively support efforts to extend and broaden the American response to the disasters of last month, engaging Congress and the appropriate agencies of our government. The task ahead will be difficult, and we know it will be full of pain, but we are friends, and in times of need, we come together and we work together as one. It is our calling to do our part to help those who are suffering to help in the rebuilding of that home. Thank you, and in particular, I want to thank my AJC colleague, Nissa Rubin, for helping to organize this fitting memorial event. Thank you. Thank you. invited by Nepali diaspora and also South Asian community uh, in various states. They are mobilized uh, 
donations from their own community. They want to hand over this to government of Nepal to the embassy. I'm very much impressed, but our need, our uh, uh, problem is really big. Huge. There is something we are not really thinking of such a deadly disaster that has taken place in less than two minutes of an earthquake. So um, I'm really, really grateful to those who prayed for us. Who sent a condolent messages to those who were lost there, not, we, not only we lost our Nepali uh, citizen, but also U.S. Marine, um, U.S. Marine, uh, one of the helicopter, one by U.S. Marine, who were in the uh, search and rescue mission, and also they were airlifting uh, relief material to the earthquake uh, victims. Crash. So, uh, my Prime Minister wanted to send a condolence message. I hand over this to the President and also requested him to convey our message to the US citizen as well. So, uh, this is the situation we are, we are facing. We are really not sure how we are really going to cope with the forthcoming monsoon. In a couple of weeks' time, uh, monsoon will start. Mm -hmm. So we have hundreds of thousands of uh, families, they are homeless at this moment. And we have no idea how to really provide shelter to them. So uh, I have discussed this in length with the White House office here, responsible for Nepal and South Asia. The afternoon, they are also very much concerned and they want to really uh, support us. So we have a follow-up meeting. This is follow-up of my, my meeting uh, with the President of Obama. So we have had to meet again on Tuesday so that the U.S. government can uh, decide about what level of support they can provide uh, immediately. And also we are discussing with our development partner about long-term uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction of earthquake devastated area. We are planning to convene a donor conference, a place in conference in fact, uh, sometime at the end of uh, May uh, or uh, end of June or first week of July. So I would like to request US government and US policy maker, US politician through you uh, so that they can be more generous to uh, our uh, citizens, our people, uh, so that uh, their immediate, immediate humanitarian needs are met. Uh, so I am trying to reach out to every possible places to convey this message. This message comes from our president and prime minister. I had a very long conversation with president and prime minister. They have uh, high expectation from U.S. Uh, because U.S. is the second uh, oldest country who had uh, violence of cooperation with Nepal after the United Kingdom. Uh, we have a very good uh, relation with the uh, U.S. government uh, and they have a big presence in Nepal. And they have uh, given us very impressive right at the beginning of this uh, disaster. So this evening I would like to request uh, US citizens, uh, opinion, opinion makers uh, in US, Washington DC, uh, and also senior politicians uh, so that uh, they can use this strengthen our bilateral cooperation and also we will be strengthen the ties between the citizens of these two countries. 
and thank you very much for this opportunity. Dr. Paul, I'm Deputy Ambassador Ruben Asar, the Embassy of Israel. Thank you very much, Ambassador Koch, uh, Jason, uh, thank you. Oh, okay. Just thank you very much, Ambassador Koch, Jason, and uh, we enjoyed the studies uh, here at the university for doing this missive. Um, you know, Israel uh, and Nepal have a, a long historic friendship, and uh, it is very difficult to grasp when you hear all these numbers of uh, hundreds of thousands of people at homes, thousands of people dead, and uh, we are at least satisfied that we do our humble share in sending uh, this uh, field hospital with more than 250 medical staff uh, that did some of the some of the work of uh, rescue and treatment of, uh, of patients. Um, I want to just mention two personal stories that uh, were really struck me as uh, give some of the one of them give. Uh, a lot of hope for the future. Uh, one of the persons that uh, were rescued after five days of the first earthquake was a 15-year-old boy uh, called Pemba Lama that uh, survived actually by drinking the water from the clothes, from his own clothes, the rain that was falling there, and eating some uh, butter that he had in a container near him until he was rescued five days after the after the earthquake, uh, he was uh, treated in the in the Israeli hospital, and this shows you how, although we are, you know, our life as humans are so is so vulnerable, uh, we are also very strong, and the, the the will to live is something very strong. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, at the end of the day, with all the self-help and the help uh, you're going to get from the international community you are going to be able to overcome. Um, exactly like Pimbalama did. There's also a, a sad story about the, the only victim of the Israeli victim of the earthquake. Uh, his name is Or Asraf. He was a 22 year old uh, uh, boy, uh, just released soldier from the army from the Avim in the south of Israel. He participated in the last operation we had in the Gaza Strip and he was injured there. And after he recovered, he took a trip to Nepal, uh, you know, as a form of uh, relief. And uh, when uh, he, you know, the, we had about uh, 200 people that were in Nepal at the moment of the earthquake that didn't didn't uh, con we didn't manage to contact them, and he was the last one. Uh, so uh, his family and his friends from his military unit went to Nepal to try to search for him and they found him actually after uh, after eight days of, uh, of searching and he was uh, he passed away um, but uh, at the end of the day uh, we are very hopeful that uh, you know through the friendships uh, that he made uh, this again will be uh, he will be a symbol of solidarity that we have within Israel but also solidarity that we have within the Nepalese people and the hope for recovery so I want to thank you very much for inviting me today and uh, thank you for hosting this event. I wish all the best for the people of Nepal and a bright future together for you and for our friendship with the United States of Israel. Thank you. We also had one of our interfaith partners, the Hindu American Foundation, uh, represented by their associate director, Jay Kansar. He's here with us. He will briefly speak. The Hindu American Foundation also has been very active in advocating for relief to uh, Nepal on the U.S. Uh, Congress and also in the community. So, Jay, thank you for coming and please uh, speak a few words. Namaste and Namaste. Shalom. <laughs> the, I think this is a fitting uh, forum for such a discussion. And it, it comes as no surprise that the Jewish American community put forth such an effort to bring, uh, to bring our communities together. When, <clears throat> when it became known that shortly after the earthquakes, or the earthquake had transpired, that, the, that Israel had sent aid and was so robustly, it was of no surprise that, and that this was from the Jewish people, from the Jewish state. 
and they came at the aid of one of the most vulnerable peoples in the world at the time, that the earthquake survivors of Nepal. The Indo-American Foundation has, since then, we have encouraged our membership throughout the United States to donate freely and donate generously to causes and to organizations that ensure uh, aid is given to the people of Nepal. And we fear not that the Jewish people have no ill intention in Nepal, however, we do worry that some organizations who may be providing aid in Nepal are doing so for to exploit the people at their most vulnerable state. And we encourage the Jewish community to stand with the people of Nepal, who are a majority Hindu and Buddhist, to ensure that their cultural heritage is a part of the healing process that will take place in Nepal from now and for years to come. And so I want to thank the Jewish American community for fostering that process. And uh, to the people of Nepal, the Hindu American Foundation represents your diaspora here in America. And we will work with you also hand in hand. Or the interface. Um, do you guys want to sit up here, maybe, so people can hear your responses? Yeah. Um, um, well, your Excellencies, if you could come up here, that would be good. Out loudly, like this. You can have Oh, I'll call on people. That's fine. Okay. Um, my name is Kay. I'm very pleased that this. Small but port important event. Um, there are times when I bug Israel, and um, in terms of uh, Israeli Palestinian peace issues, and when Israel is involved in something like this, I'm very, very proud. So, this is another dimension of a Jewish person's relationship with Israel. I have a very crazy suggestion that I have never heard of in an earthquake, earthquake and in disasters, and it's very cheap. I don't know the temperature in Nepal right now, roughly. Uh, roughly how warm or how cold is it? It's very difficult to tell you that. So it's a much difficult question that you have. <laughs> really? <laughs> Nepal is a small country within 200 kilometers. Uh -huh. We have around the year snow. Yeah. And yeah. also okay. very hard. Within, within 200 kilometers. Well, I have a tiny so it's because you know which part of country we are talking about. I have a tiny suggestion that I have never seen in disaster relief. And um, I didn't even need mine that I brought to the first Obama inauguration because I had seven layers of clothing on and I didn't need it. But those silver blankets that sell for three or four dollars after a, a, a marathon um, that are in hardware stores. I keep one in the car in case of emergency. I had one at the inauguration, and after the wind was blowing, you were there. Um, after the wind was blowing, I tried to get the Boy Scouts to collect them for the homeless. They are, I tested mine in my living room a long time ago. They're very, very warm, and they are very, very cheap, and they're very easy to ship. They are packed like this in a little silver blanket, and please. I think, I think pass exactly what you're talking about are very commonly available for disaster relief. I've never really. seen them used, no, so not that I'm there on the scene. Very, very common in, in disaster relief. Okay, meeting. good. Okay. It's a good suggestion. My rest. <laughs> um, you know, could you please explain as to how the Israeli, uh, the Israel, how exactly its institutional involvement throughout the years, um, how you know, a fixed uh, a feature has it been part of the Israeli government? Um, could you possibly trace the evolution of that particular arm of Israeli government and where you're allowed to take it? Israel actually is not uh, an official part of the I'm talking to Mike. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Israel is not uh, an agency of the Israeli government. It's uh, actually an NGO uh, that uh, receives uh, actually assistance from, facilitates the, the delivery of, of assistance uh, by getting donations either from the government from NGOs inside, uh, from uh, private people, NGOs inside Israel, and of course from donors outside Israel, like for example AJC. The, the first effort, the, the, the most robust effort of Israel uh, to Nepal was done by, by the Israel Defense Forces, by the planes that they, they sent and the hospital they, they did, they, they put there. And Israel usually uh, manages to be a, a pretty swift responder uh, because it has the experience of getting to places all over the world. Uh, it has been uh, very active, for example, uh, on Ebola. Um, Ebola was uh, actually 
in Western Africa was a very difficult challenge because people were afraid of going there and actually they had the right people to, to go and work with the government of Sierra Leone and other places. So there, there are sometimes places in which it's easier for an organization like Israel to get there uh, even before the government uh, gets there. It, it, it wasn't here the case in Nepal right now because the IDF came first, but uh, I'm sure that also Israel is going to stay there for longer and continue supplying, uh, supplying relief uh, to the extent that it can. So, with the, in 2001, there was a similar massive earthquake in my home state of Gujarat in India. And again, the smallest nation sent the largest field hospital. That time, India's own uh, disaster management uh, uh, force was non-existent. Now, of course, India was the country that sent the largest mission, 450. Israel was number two in Nepal, sending about 260 uh, IDF personnel. And we saw, even at that time in 2001 and even now, that there was a great, wonderful cooperation between the IDF and the Nepal Army at that time with the Indian Army, where the local army provided the logistical support for ensuring that the Israeli hospital was set up within six uh, hours of landing. And uh, so, I, and an HAC where I work, our Project Indigenous Institute, takes missions to Israel of experts. And one recommendation that I'm going to make to my seniors and also to the Jewish community is to ensure that more experts from Nepal are brought to Israel from the government and from civil society uh, to train them in disaster, to give them disaster mitigation and preparedness training. I think there's no country in the world that has the experience and the expertise that Israel does. So this is an appeal that as an Asian Jew, I will make to my American Jewish brothers and sisters is to ensure that more experts are able to come from Nepal in, uh, so that the country is better prepared for any future natural calamity. Obviously, the first priority is to ensure that those who have been affected, homeless, or are injured or sick are taken care of. But can you elaborate on some of the damage done to the hundreds or thousands of years old of history and culture in Nepal, like the temples and the uh, <coughs> archaeological sites that have been damaged? And, what it will take for, the, and what does Nepal require from the international community to preserve those and to restore them to some, <clears throat> to some uh, level of suitability? Uh, this, <coughs> this cultural heritage, archaeological sites are not often considered as emergency or priority issues. Because we are dealing with the human casualty and humanitarian issue at this moment. But it is really very important for us to think about those historical monuments. Uh, in fact, uh, we have lost so many, in fact, almost uh, all oldest uh, structures of archaeological, uh, archaeological importance uh, monuments. Uh, including the historical palace, uh, which we call Singha Tarva, where uh, Council of Ministry says at this moment, it is also damaged. It is not okay. Our Prime Minister's office is in a tent now. Okay. They are not able to work from there. The president is working from a tent. So, presidential palace is also gone. Uh, it's not really going to be uh, in a state of uh, operation in the uh, near future. So it cost billions of dollars in fact. You really count that. We, we, to be very frank and honest with you, I have no idea. And no one has time to really think about this. Because of the subsequent travel after the big earthquake. So people, whole nation is really terrorized, terrified. So only our military, police, and some of the security officials are uh, involved in rescue and relief work. Most of our uh, people, okay, even okay, NGOs, civil society, all volunteer organizations, they, 
themselves are in trouble. They, they themselves are victims. So uh, that's why the role of uh, international uh, uh, military forces were very important and now we have a very skilled armed force, who coordinated international armed forces to provide uh, the rescue and relief uh, support to the victim in the very beginning. But your question about this culture of lenity, it is very difficult to estimate, but I can only tell you that it's a huge loss. And it might take several years, if not a decade, to restore all those uh, monument, all of the structures, and it will cost billions and billions. And I have no idea how we are really address these uh, the challenges, but we are very much concerned. Exploitation of the people. Can you elaborate a little on what what you mean by that? Sure, right now. Happened. Social media became ablaze with people sending their, their good wishes to the people of Nepal and their prayers. But with that also came very, um, if I may just speak frankly, almost condescending and very uh, condescending remarks from people on social media, particularly of one faith community who said that uh, the, the downtrodden heathens of Nepal should arise with the, with the spirit of Christ now. And the uh, evangelical organizations, um, some of whom are USAID part implementing partners, uh, were, were named as some of the organizations who would deliver the, the word of Christ to the people of Nepal in their time of need. Now, there are many Christian organizations, I will say, that do excellent work and deliver aid and aid only when needed. And that is why the Hindu people have, Hindu people have absolutely no um, <clears throat> concern that the, the Jewish people have nothing but good intentions with the people, for the people of Nepal because they are, the Jewish faith is not a proselytizing faith, just like Hinduism is not a proselytizing faith. And this is something that we've noted in the tsunami of 2004 and in a number of different uh, relief efforts in Asia and Africa and Latin America. So we hope that the U.S. government, number one, any organizations that are USA implementing partners, are scrutinized to ensure that they are not using this as an opportunity to evangelize in Nepal. And also we we are hoping that the Hindu community and the international community will come to Nepal's aid to ensure that it's thousands of years old of cultural heritage of Hindu, of a Hindu kingdom and Hindu <clears throat> and Buddhist kingdom will be part of the healing process. And that 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 culture and that heritage can rise again as something that the world celebrates. In fact, the, um, if I may speak frankly, the Israeli armed forces, after uh, what I've been told is that after their two years of service, they oftentimes go to India and to Nepal uh, to seek solace and to, to rejuvenate their spiritual being. And, and so we hope that the world will, will, be, will be able to take, uh, <clears throat> will be able to partake in those same uh, in those same spiritual experiences. Um, I know that uh, it will take time, as, as I'm sure the tourism industry in Nepal is completely shut down and will be for, for several months, if not a year at least, but um, it's important that that be celebrated again and that the international community, because that is one of Nepal's number one economic, um, economic drivers, and number two, it is such an integral part to the the soul of Nepal. It's so important that we have a professor who actually wrote a book on the Indian Israeli community, and she's considering now something about the Israeli community in India because there's there's such a strong presence. So to be with us here today, and especially Mr. Ambassador, I'm sorry for your loss and what is happening in your country now. Thank you for taking the time to share share the situation with us. I'd be interested to hear about any sort of special considerations that are being given during this difficult time to more vulnerable groups, for example, women, children, elderly, um, see if there's any special considerations or anything that's happening in this uh, 
process of the yeah, group of people have the uh, in a very serious need of support. They are the among the victims. They are the worst affected, hardest hardest hit uh, group of people. So from our uh, government uh, side, we have a, we have set up a prime minister relief fund. So they have given top priority. The first priority of uh, support is to really reach out to this most vulnerable group of people. So we have not only women, children, but also disabled uh, people, elderly community, or, uh, people, pregnant women. Uh, they are the most uh, considered most vulnerable. So we have uh, given a special attention to them. Uh, but our problem is uh, it's not only houses, but also most of the public infrastructures are also damaged. Our rural hospitals are not in a state of operation at this moment. So I spoke to White House <coughs> officials this morning. They wanted to know what I want from them. So I was one of the things I was asking them is to support for uh, rebuilding, reconstruction of uh, rural hospitals. So they can provide better service to not only women, children, but also elderly people, and disabled. They are right there in their village. Some of those villages uh, which are devastated by earthquake, it, okay, it's really far away from the roadheads. It takes several days for us to walk to reach out to these villages. They are very remote. We don't have road access to this place. So that's why we needed to use helicopter to airlift medicine, doctors, and rescuers at, at that time. And still some of them are uh, doing their duty in these remote villages. So, for instance, I know a number of Israeli um, and Jewish organizations that are giving aid to Nepal. Tebel Betzedek is the one that I like, but there's Israel Aid, there's the Jewish, uh, the Joint Distribution Committee, there's American Jewish World Service, there's a lot of organizations, and I presume all the faith communities have many organizations. Who's coordinating, you know, what everyone's doing? I mean, on the one hand, if Israel's going to fly in a hospital and 260 doctors, that's going to be used regardless. I mean, it can only help. But to her point, what if everybody's bringing blankets and no one's bringing food? Or, you know what I'm saying, how, how is the coordination effort being so managed? Like he Thank you very much. When it started to be pouring in, so we had this, our immediate <coughs> concern was this. In fact, we had set up a central coordination mechanism under the Home Ministry. Uh, we have also uh, set up uh, Prime Minister Relief uh, Fund under the chairmanship of National, uh, National Planning Commission Vice Chairman. So these two bodies are the key coordinating body in order to provide uh, assistance and also uh, relief and rescue uh, work in the fall. So in the beginning, when we all of us were traumatized, we terrified about we, all those subsequent travels. Uh, we had no idea how to coordinate this. So everyone, those who had something, they used to come and I wanted to give this to somebody. That was the idea of most people at the time. So, <clears throat> so there were okay, more blankets in certain area, less food. There were some more, more clothes in some districts, but it is because its devastation is huge, enormous. So none of those okay, initiatives were able to provide enough basic okay, supply at that time. So there was security risk as well. So everybody wanted to get it. That's why coordination was something that government wanted to do, steer from the center. Because the hardest hit uh, earthquake zone was also the Kathmandu Valley, the capital of the port. So, uh, 
we wanted to do that, but it was not really possible at that time because uh, people were concerned, oh, we have right to reach out, we have, we have right to provide something. But when a uh, couple of days passed, then people have realized that it is impossible to reach out. We need somebody to coordinate. So they themselves started to con uh, contact our home ministry. So we have uh, supported them, uh, coordinated, and uh, advised them where to bring what. So home ministry is the central coordinating authority at this moment. Uh, but we have we have also concern about okay, not only in in Nepal but also in okay, I have received. Uh, more than 20 emails this afternoon expressing, expressing concern from various U.S. citizens about fundraising initiative taking place here. So more than 5,000 uh, organizational group are collecting donations in the name of Nepali earthquake victims. They have, it seems to me that they have raised millions and millions. So there are concerns from some concerned citizens that we, whether these uh, resources are going to Reach to the victim or not. That's why a large number of uh, group who started to collect this fund decided to uh, hand over the, to embassy here so that we can uh, we, we can send this to crime relief fund. So. There are concerns from within the USA as well. Many, millions. Uh, we, it seems to me that okay, millions of US dollars are collected. But we don't know okay, where they are going. There should be some kind of coordinating okay, mechanism within the United States as well. So there are some uh, concerned citizens, they want to track down okay, how much was raised and how much was is reaching to uh, earthquake survivor. Uh, they are expressing their concern. They are asking embassy's involvement in tracking down all those uh, work. Uh, but we have limited capacity. And we cannot really monitor all these things. But you see, I am really pleased to let you know that uh, when I had uh, discussed with the president uh, Monday, I, I have requested. 501c3 five, five, status. Non-profit. Huh? Non non-profit organization non status. Non-profit. It is not really aware. Okay. The White House officer told me that it's not really the You don't have a law in this country for non-profit making organization. You only get the tax free code. Right. That's what I was told yes, by right, exactly. the White House official this morning. So, they are thinking of providing us the tax free code uh, so that uh, all those interested U.S. citizens and Nepali diaspora, South Asian community can also donate directly to uh, Prime Minister Relief Fund through embassy account here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is why we are uh, initiating and because we need to, and we have a very transparent website and also uh, we have, uh, the government of Nepal decided not to use any donation money on overhead expenditures. So we are not going to pay salary, allowances, or use uh, donation money for transportation, and also we want to use that money for renting helicopters and others. So every dollar people donate through these accounts, reach out to uh, earthquake victims directly. Find our uh, Nepal government bank account in our website. Okay. Uh, you can do that from credit card, debit card, or okay. you can also issue check in the embassy name. Okay. So that uh, we uh, we can because I have been receiving several uh, <coughs> bank check. People are coming voluntarily. <laughs> I was told by one of my staff uh, yesterday, no, day before yesterday, somebody was walking in front of our embassy. When that person saw an embassy, our signboard, he popped in and he wanted to give a small amount of money. <laughs> it was not a big amount of money, but it was really interesting. <laughs>